Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for the warm introduction. So exciting to see all of you here today and interacting in the chat. And I encourage you to keep interacting in the chat as we um, go through the information today. Um, so I am just thrilled to have you here today as we explore this very important uh, aspect of living with vasculitis, and that is grief. Um, now, when I present this workshop, a lot of people think grief, isn't that something that we talk about at funerals, right? Um, well, not quite. Grief is something that we all experience in many ways, many different ways, um, especially when, when living with a life-changing diagnosis like vasculitis. So grief is, you know, it's always, it's not always a fun topic to talk about, but the fact that you're all here today um, at this workshop really shows that you are strong and you are resilient and open to hearing the information uh, that I have to share. So welcome. Um, first things first, I've got a little disclosure that I'm required to uh, show here. I have no relevant financial or non-financial relationships to disclose. Um, just a lot of love and appreciation for what the Vasculitis Foundation does for all of us living with vasculitis. So next, I'm going to go over our workshop agenda. So I do have quite a bit of information to share with you all today. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to introduce who I am, a little bit more about myself. Uh, we're going to understand grief's many forms, how to recognize symptoms, the physical manifestations of grief, and then we've got some self-reflection prompts, embracing what I call your MVP, and, and apply the three H's approach, and then finally community and support. So let me know in the chat if you're excited to get started. First things first is I want to, um, you know, I think it's important to share who it's important to share who I'm not. I think it's, you know, it's always important to know who you're listening to, but sometimes it's good to know who you're not listening to. So here's a quick rundown of who I'm not. I am not a medical doctor or a licensed therapist. Um, I am also not a uh, here to provide medical advice or treatments. I'm sure many of you have heard this before from different uh, presenters. I'm also not someone who claims to have all of the answers or a one size fits all solution. And I firmly believe that if anyone out there, um, if you come across someone who, who says that they have a solution to, to everything, I, I would advise against that because <laughs> it's it gets complicated, right? Um, I'm also not someone who dismisses the emotional and the psychological aspects of dealing with vasculitis. And I'm also not someone who underestimates the complexity and the individuality of each person's journey living with vasculitis. So on to who I am. So I am a board certified health and wellness coach with training from Duke University. I am a vasculitis patient. I've been living with GPA since 2018. Um, I have experienced the challenges of living with vasculitis. And although I look pretty healthy on the outside, especially that um, nice uh, you know, photo shoot shot there on my screen, I can tell you that I have most definitely been in the trenches. I faced a lot of up and ups and downs and uh, come out on the other side with a few battle scars, mostly um, my saddle nose, which you probably can't see on Zoom. Um, I have loss of hearing, you know, I've gone through the medication side effects, the insurance battles, you name it. So when I say that I get it, I truly, truly do. Um, my journey with vasculitis was the catalyst for creating Brightly Thrive app, which we are a membership-based app dedicated to supporting those with autoimmune. And I'm also someone passionate about empowering people through education, support, and community. And I'm also a lifelong learner who values authenticity, support, and holistic well-being. So I'm always learning something new every single day. So now let's get into understanding grief's many forms when it comes to vasculitis. So first off, let's define grief in this context. When it comes to vasculitis, it's really about, I would say, mourning the losses that come with being diagnosed with this condition. It's about losing 
parts of your life that you once held close. And it's perfectly okay to feel this way. Um, disenfranchised grief. And let me know in the chat if you've heard of this term, disenfranchised grief. This is the type of grief that isn't openly acknowledged or uh, socially validated or even in, um, something that's like publicly talked about. In other words, it's the, it's the kind of grief that society typically will overlook or it doesn't recognize as being this legitimate form of grief. Um, and trust me, it's more common than you think. So we all know that this is a safe space for you to share as much as you're comfortable with. So as I'm going through this list of ways that you can experience grief, let me know in the comments if you've also experienced this too or have had maybe some different type of loss that you want to share. So um, first, let's talk about the first one, which is loss of control. So one of the first things that you might feel is this sense of loss of control. Suddenly your body is not doing, you know, what it is supposed to do. Um, it can be, this feeling can be incredibly frustrating, right? And even oftentimes people describe as a bit disoriented. Um, the second one is loss of trust in one's body. So... This is closely related um, to, you know, make, feeling like it's very hard to feel secure and just kind of confident um, in your daily life. The next one we have is, a, a, which is the most common one, which is a loss of health and well-being. This is kind of the most obvious loss, right? You find yourself mourning the old health that you maybe once had. You might not be able to do everything you used to love, whether it's running marathons or hiking or even just dancing around in the living room. Um, it's okay to feel sad about these changes. This kind of loss is really profound and can be felt very deeply. Then we have a loss of personal identity. So with these changes, you might feel like you've lost your personal identity. Who are you now with this condition, right? You might feel like even a stranger to yourself. Uh, maybe you're struggling to find, you know, what does my new normal look like? Um, but I do want to point out one thing. I do want you to all to remember that your essence, your spirit is still the same. It's just, it's all about finding new ways um, to shine. The next one we have, and this is a pretty difficult one for most people, is loss of relationships. Um, vasculitis can really put a strain on even the toughest and strongest uh, relationships that we have with others. Friends and family might not always understand what you're going through, and some relationships might sort of fade away or even come to an end altogether. And with that can come some really profound grief. And then the last one we have is loss of employment or financial stability. So for some of us, you know, vasculitis might impact our ability to work or perhaps ability to work in our old professions, which leads to a loss of employment or financial stability. And we all know that that can add a whole new layer of stress and worry. So these are just some of the most common um, losses when it comes to vasculitis. Of course, there's others, uh, but these are the ones that I chose today to kind of go over. And I see we have a comment here from Lori who says, absolutely, thank you for naming this. I have not heard of the term before. For my friends without a rare disease, they do not get it. Yes, that's why that um, disenfranchised grief is, you know, it's just so complicated and it's just very difficult for people to understand. But the good news is, is coming up here shortly, we're going to talk about ways that you can communicate to your loved ones about how you're feeling and what you're experiencing. So now that we discussed, discussed what disenfranchised grief is and why it's significant, I want to move on to recognizing the symptoms. So just disenfranchised grief can manifest in many ways that might be different from traditional um, sadness or mourning. And it's really important to be able to identify these signs in ourselves and others. 
Um, so the first one we have is feelings of isolation and loneliness. And I think that we collectively could probably agree that we've all felt this way at some point. Um, we might feel cut off from others because they don't understand or acknowledge um, our grief. This can lead to that deep sense of loneliness. Even You can even be lonely when you are surrounded by other people. Uh, because you just have that feeling that they're not understanding what you're going through, especially with something like vasculitis, which oftentimes is, you know, part of that invisible uh, disease. So the next one we have is unacknowledged sadness or anger. So you might find yourself feeling sad or angry without really understanding why. These emotions can be linked to your grief of having this uh, vasculitis condition, even if you haven't explicitly um, acknowledged that perhaps that's maybe where that root of that those feelings are coming from. We also have a minimization of your own feelings. So I don't know about you all out there, but I know I've been guilty of this. I might downplay my own feelings telling myself that my grief isn't valid or that I should just suck it up and tough it up and, you know, just march on and that um, I shouldn't be feeling this way, right? This is what we call that self-minimization. And that can really um, hinder our progress. It can really prevent us from fully processing our emotions. The next one we have is emotional numbness or a detachment. So sometimes to cope with this maybe unrecognized grief, we might become emotionally numb or detached. And this is a way that we, uh, we use this as a way to sort of protect ourselves from pain. But again, on the flip side, you know, it might make us feel safe in the moment and protect us, but it also makes it incredibly hard to connect with others and to feel a true sense of um, joy. And the next one we have is a difficulty uh, expressing our grief. So when your grief isn't recognized by others, it can be really challenging to express it openly. You might feel like you've got to keep your feelings to yourself, as I was, you know, mentioning before. Um, and it just makes that process even harder uh, to go through. And then the last one we have is the increased anxiety or even a depression. So unacknowledged grief, if you're, if you um, are not able to make that connection to maybe your diagnosis and your condition, it can contribute to a heightened sense of anxiety or even uh, depression. You'll feel more anxious, you'll feel more sad than usual. Um, and it's really, you know, it's important to recognize these feelings as potential um, indicators of this disenfranchised grief. <clears throat> so really understanding these symptoms is the first step in towards um, acknowledging them and then, of course, addressing them. So by recognizing those signs, we can start to really validate our own experiences and seek the support that we need. And this is what I love about the Vasculitis Foundation is that it's a safe place for us to share our experiences, our stories, um, and feel seen and heard and supported. And I feel that, you know, people with vasculitis more than ever, they, they just need to be recognized and we need, we need that place to be able to share. Um, I see that Lori says she relates to so much that we're outlining right now. It's so helpful just to have it acknowledged. And yes, I agree. And Carrie says, yes, they don't get that she's immunosuppressed and can't get too close. And so there's a lot of mis, you know, um, misunderstanding out there, especially with people around us who don't know what we're going through. So we'll talk about ways that we can support that process as well. So next, we want to recognize the, the um, physical symptoms. Now, a lot of these physical symptoms are going to overlap with just having vasculitis in itself, right? Um, so the first one is fatigue and exhaustion. So I know I have days where I ebb and flow with um, fatigue, and that is really one of the most common physical symptoms also of this grief or disenfranchised grief. It's this feeling of complete overwhelming fatigue. You might feel tired all the time, even if you're getting enough sleep. Um, grief, that feeling of grief can really 
totally zap your energy and it makes it really hard to get through the day. So, um, you know, with having vasculitis, having this condition, we really have to protect our energy and um, learn to manage our energy. And so if we're dealing with grief, that's definitely something that we want to be able to address. Um, sleep disturbances are common. Um, you know, when you're uh, experiencing feelings of grief, you might struggle falling asleep or even staying asleep, or you might find yourself oversleeping. Um, some people will use sleep as an escape uh, from their emotions, from those feelings of grief and anxiety and depression and all those, uh, the sadness and the overwhelm. Um, so they'll just, you know, use sleep as a way to kind of shut everything out and um, not have to deal with that. You may have changes in your appetite. You can uh, find yourself maybe overeating or seeking some comfort in food. Others might lose their appetite entirely uh, due to grief and they struggle to not eat anything at all. And both of these extremes are really common and definitely signs that grief is, you know, taking a toll, um, toll on your body for sure. The next one we have is headaches and migraines. So stress and emotional strain can lead to frequent headaches, migraines even. They can be persistent. They're debilitating. Um, I suffer from migraines. And it just adds this whole other layer of difficulty to your daily life. So we definitely want to process that um, disenfranchised grief in healthy ways. Muscle tension and aches. Um, you know, grief can cause that, that muscle tension because your nervous system is constantly tight. Um, you're getting those aches and pains throughout your body. You might notice it mostly in your neck or in your shoulders or in your back. And that can be really a physical indication that that manifestation of grief is there and that, that stress and that sadness that you're carrying. And then, of course, stomach issues. Um, grief can affect the digestive system. It can lead to um, stomach aches or other digestive problems. You know, we often refer to our gut, our stomach, as our second brain because it reacts, you know, so sensitively sensitively to emotional stress, right? And grief is a big, big emotional stress. And then of course, weakened immune system. And I think this is important for all of us is that having that prolonged grief will weaken our immune system even more, which makes us even more susceptible to illnesses and infect infections. So if you find yourself getting sick more often, it might be leaked linked to just the emotional toll that the grief is taking on your physical body. And then we have heart palpitations or chest pain. Sometimes really, really intense grief can cause those physical sensations in your chest. Um, these symptoms are can be really alarming. So they're often linked to stress and anxiety that come with grief. So it's definitely something to be aware of. Just recognizing all of these different physical symptoms, it just helps us understand that grief and disenfranchised grief is not something that just um, is isolated to our minds, right? It definitely affects our entire body because we are one whole being and everything is interconnected. So now that we've explored the various forms of grief, both the physical and the emotional manifestations, we're going to switch gears to talk about something a little more uplifting, um, how we can support ourselves through this process um, in, in it's important to remember that, you know, while grief is a really challenging journey, there are a lot of strategies that we can use to empower ourselves and find strength along the way. A lot of these strategies I personally use, um, you know, on a regular basis. So I'm excited to share just some of these, uh, you know, practical steps with you. So first and foremost, I want you all to practice self-compassion. I want you to be kind to yourself. Grief is hard. Vasculitis is hard. It is okay to have bad days. You might wake up some mornings feeling like you're ready to conquer the world. Um, and other days, you know, it's going to be a struggle just to get out of bed. Um, and that's perfectly okay. Practicing self-compassion means that you're giving yourself permission to feel every single emotion, every high and low without any judgment. It's really about acknowledging what you're going through, that it's tough, you know, and it's a normal, it's so normal to have 
almost like a roller coaster, you know, range of emotions from sadness to anger to confusion to fear. Um, I think that we have all experienced those at some point or another. So one tactic that I like to use is I want you to imagine how you would respond to a dear friend who is going through a similar situation. You probably wouldn't tell your dear friend to just get over it or stop being sad, right? Instead, you would offer them words of comfort and understanding and you would offer them some patience. You would listen to them without trying to fix their problems or um, you, know, you would offer them this safe space for them to express their feelings. So I want you to now, become your best friend. And I want you to try to turn that same kindness and understanding towards yourself. So when you catch yourself being overly critical or harsh, and I'm, you know, I, this is something that I practice every day because, you know, those thoughts in our mind, those thoughts are powerful and they creep up. Um, and those, you know, critical thoughts will creep into my mind some, sometimes. And I'll say, okay, you know, would I say this to my best friend? If the answer is no, then I reconsider why am I saying this to myself, right? It's all about giving yourself that grace to grieve and that permission to really heal yourself at your own pace. The next strategy is about self-reflection. So especially on those tough days, this is when we need those strategies the most, right? Is for those tough days when everything feels overwhelming. So self-reflection is a really powerful tool to help us navigate emotions and find sort of a sense of balance. Um, so I want to share with you some journal prompts, or I also love to call these mind tools. These are just to help guide you through challenging moments. Some of you may already be um, have an active, you know, journal practice. If you do, I'd love to know in the chat if you're currently journaling. Um, some of you may find journaling challenging and, um, you know, some people will like to record themselves into a recorder as a way of kind of mind dumping um, the, the feelings that they're feeling. And that's okay too. Some people just like to sit in silence and sort of think about these journaling prompts and kind of process things on their own, um, kind of in a silent way. Um, there's no, you know, right or wrong way to really go about journaling prompts. Um, so here is the first one. And that is, what is something I am thankful for right now in this moment? So can you think of three things that you're grateful for? Doesn't have to be super huge, doesn't have to be, you know, something that is monumental or anything like that. It can simply be, you know, I'm grateful for being able to look out the window and see the sun shining, right? Or um, I'm grateful that I was able to get out of bed this morning and, you know, get dressed and feel good about myself. The next prompt is what do I need in this moment to feel supported? So I really like this prompt because this really, um, you know, identifies what is it that I really need? You know, it's, a, it's just a really good uh, prompt to be able to identify that. What is my need? And then how, do, how am I going to go to get, you know, who or where am I going to go to get this need and feels, um, you know, get this need fulfilled and feel supported? The next one is how can I be kinder to myself? So I really like this one as well. Um, reflecting on ways that you can show yourself kindness. It might be through, you know, some positive self-talk, maybe some time for some self-care. Maybe showing yourself some kindness is just being gentle with yourself. I think that can be, make such a big difference in how we handle the, the tough days. You know, if we just say to ourselves, hey, I'm having a tough day and it's okay. It's okay. I don't have to try to change my feelings. I don't have to try to, you know, talk myself out of feeling this way. I can simply just feel this way and let those emotions come. The next one is what small steps can I take to nurture my well-being? So think about um, I really like micro steps. So these are like micro actions. These are just little ways that we can nurture our well-being. So things like taking a short walk, maybe it's, you know, preparing a healthy meal or um, even just 
taking a time out and just taking, you know, some um, deep breaths, right? Just to kind of recenter ourselves. Um, these little tiny micro actions, those small steps really help to add up and make us feel more in control. The next prompt I have is who can I reach out to for support or comfort? So really think about, identify who is that person that you talk, talk to, whether it's a friend or a family member member or a partner, support group, reaching out for support is going to provide you the comfort and remind you that you're not alone in this journey, which is so important. And that also creates that sense of safety with us and not just a mental safety, but it lets our bodies know that we are safe. It lets, it sends a signal to our nervous system that, Hey, I can take a few breaths. I have someone that I can reach out to and I'm, I'm safe. The next one is what is one positive thing I can focus on today? So if you're having a really, really tough day, this could be something so small, like I, you know, was able to get up and enjoy a cup of tea today, or I, you know, am going to appreciate the sunset tonight, right? Focusing on a little positive moment will really help to shift your perspective and gives you that little boost in your mood. And then the last one is, have I shown resilience in the past and how can I apply this now? So I really love this prompt because it forces us to sort of look back on our past experiences and where we've dem demonstrated re resilience. And I know we all have. So remembering how we have overcome challenges before, it sends a signal to our brain. It gives us that strength and that confidence to face whatever challenging thing we're facing on that tough day. Think about those strategies that helped you and how you can use those now. So those are my favorite self-reflection journal prompts. You are free to take a screenshot of those or snap a picture with your phone and use those, um, you know, however you want to use them. I see some people in the chat. Uh, Jenny says she's recently began art journaling as a part of her healing process. And I see that um, uh, Liz is using a uh, Clever Fox self-care journal, which she finds really useful, focusing on what she's grateful for and self-act cares that she does every day. I really like that. I'm going to definitely have to look up that journal. That sounds really uh, super neat. Thank you for sharing that. And Deborah says, what makes this stuff such a tough journey is that grief is renewed every day. It's not something that's fixed at one point and goes away. That's such a um, very important point to make, Deborah. For herself, she says there's been so much loss and continued illness and side effects and, you know, the medications and all of those things. It really does take a big um, drain. She says she uses a lot of the techniques, but the loss of mobility and the job and ability to travel, it does get overwhelming, Deborah. I totally, um, I have been there and it is, it is not an easy journey, but yes, gratitude is our friend. It's really, really hard to be fearful and to be overwhelmed when you're in a state of gratitude. Like those two, those things can't coexist, right? So it's almost like gratitude, it really becomes your superpower. All right, so now I wanna talk about how you can become your own MVP. And no, I'm not talking about most valuable player, although I would say all of us here are the most valuable players. We're definitely champions in our own right. But I'm talking about mindfulness and um, visualization and purpose. So these three practices can be kind of those secret weapons to finding peace and balance amidst all of the roller coaster uh, challenges that we all go through. So mindfulness is simply being present in the moment. Um, it is all about being fully engaged in whatever you're doing at the moment. It is like giving your brain a little vacation from the stresses and the worries. You, uh, you know, and I think people think mindfulness, we hear a lot about mindfulness now, right? It's becoming much, much more mainstream. It used to be, you know, only the Buddhist monks would sit cross-legged on a mountaintop to practice mindfulness. But now we're realizing that this is an everyday practice that we can adopt. So simply focusing on our breath, um, noticing the sensations that are happening in our physical body, listening to sounds around us. These are all mindfulness practices. It's all about 
tuning into the here and the now, which can really help calm your mind and reduce stress. Now, vis visualization, it might sound a little um, woo-woo to some people, but this is really just a simple practice where you just picture some positive outcomes, close your eyes, imagine a positive outcome for a situation that you're facing, um, see it in detail, see the sights and the sounds and, and the feelings that it brings. And just this visualization practice can really boost your mood. It increases a lot of motivation within you and it just makes you feel um, more in control. And it's another great way to just give your mind a break from negative thoughts. And sometimes we'll have clients who say, well, you know, I can't visualize the future. I can't visualize myself in this state. And I will often tell them to um, think about one of your most happiest times or some uh, one of your greatest memories. And you can even go back to that moment and use that as your visualization practice. And that's a really great way to put your mind at ease. And then the last one is purpose. It's really about finding and connecting with what your purpose is. This can be incredibly grounding. This is what drives you. It what get, it's what gives your life meaning. It could be you know, your family, of course. It could be a passion project. Maybe it's a cause that you care deeply about. When you're connected to a bigger purpose, it's really easier to navigate tough times because you have your North Star. You have that clear why that's guiding you. So think of it as, you know, your, um, your North Star that's helping you stay the course no matter what. So the next one I wanna share is a simple, powerful approach to getting the support that you need. So I use this with my own family. I use this with my um, husband. I use this with my children. So this is embracing the three H's. This is heard, helped, or hugged. So figuring out what type of support that you need in any given moment. Do I want to be heard? Sometimes you just need someone to listen to you. You don't want advice or solutions, right? I know I've been there where I just want to be heard. I don't want anyone to try to solve my problem. Um, I just want to express my feelings and I want someone to validate them. So the next time you're talking to a family member or a friend, you can try saying something like, I, I don't need you to try to fix this for me. I just really, really want you to listen to me. It's really a great way to get that emotional support without feeling overwhelmed by unwanted advice. And I think you can all agree, living with vasculitis, we get a lot of unwanted advice from people uh, all the time because I know I've been there. The next one is, do I want to be helped? So there are going to be times when you actually need assistance, right? You need like practical, tangible help, whether it's maybe you need help running an errand or maybe finding some resources. Um, asking for help can really help to lighten your load. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, communicate clearly to others that, hey, I could really use some help. Would you mind helping me with this? And I promise you that people are oftentimes more willing to assist. They just need to know that we need the help. And I think a lot of times too, this difficult can be difficult for um, women because we tend to take on a lot and we uh, feel guilty if we need to ask for help. But I want us all to practice that permission of allowing ourselves to ask for the help. And then the last one is, do I want to be hugged? And this is just the power of, you know, a good hug from one of your loved ones. It can be incredibly comforting. It can be incredibly grounding. Um, if you're comfortable with it, you know, asking for a hug is going to provide that emotional support and really that sense of connection. And it's perfectly okay to just say, you know, I just really could use a hug right now. Um, and if physical touch isn't your thing, that's okay too. You know, um, it might just be, hey, would you mind sitting with me right now? I'm just having some tough feelings, right? Um, so we can, you know, connect in different ways. And sometimes maybe you want to apply all three of the H's. Maybe you want to be heard and maybe you want to be helped and maybe you just need a good hug. So all three are perfectly normal to have at any time. The next one that we are going to uh, talk about are some phrases that you can use to help you communicate to your caregivers or your loved ones. And these phrases 
are really designed to help people understand your experiences, provide you support. Um, they open up the dialogue that acknowledges the emotional challenges, challenges with living with vasculitis, um, create more support for you. I recommend that you screenshot these. We're going to go through them here. The first one is, I know my grief might not be obvious, but losing aspects of my health has been really painful for me. So I find that that's a really good phrase to use with people to help them understand. The next one is, even though you can't see my illness, it's a significant loss that I'm still grieving. The next one is, my health condition has changed my life in many ways that are hard to describe. And I'm mourning those changes. So I think, you know, Vasculitis is a hard thing to describe. You know, the feelings, the emotional, the physical, the, all of the things that we go through. Um, sometimes we just don't have the words and that's okay. Um, I think that's a really good phrase to use with others. The next one is your support means a lot to me. Sometimes I just need you to acknowledge my grief, acknowledge that I'm grieving. And the next one is, I know it's hard to understand, but my condition affects more than my body. It also impacts my emotions too. So that's probably one of my favorite phrases, especially when I'm having one of those tough days. Um, you know, it it's uh, it's not really the person's fault that they don't understand too, right? Um, they, you know, they can't put themselves in our shoes. They don't know what we're going through. They can't they don't, you know, know the feelings that are coming up. Um, so I really like that one. It's hard to, you know, I know it's hard to understand, but it's affecting more than my body. I'm really, it's, I'm having a, a you know, a struggle with um, how it's impacting my emotions. And then the last one is, I appreciate your patience. Some days are better than others, and your understanding really helps me more than you know. So this is another one that I really love because you're telling that person, you're showing appreciation for that person. Hey, thanks for being patient. I know that I said I was, you know, going to meet you for lunch um, today, but um, I'm just having one of those tough days and it's just been really hard. And hey, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you're so understanding, right? And that really creates that connection with that person and lets them know you appreciate them, but then also lets them know where exactly, you know, are you coming from? So if you haven't screenshotted these phrases, I highly recommend you do take a quick snap of those because those definitely come in handy and, you know, they just take a little bit of practice, right? It's just having those in your toolkit um, to use to help, you know, different people in your life really understand the challenges. Um, I miss the person. I forgot there was a few more on here. I miss the person I was before my illness and I'm grieving that loss. And that's a process that I need to go through. And then please try to listen without offering me solutions right now. Sometimes I just want to be, you know, heard and validated. And it would mean a lot to me if you could ask me how I'm feeling, even if it's difficult for me to talk about. So I think that that's really important too. just being, um, you know, having our loved ones reach out to us and just say, hey, how are you feeling? You know, how are you doing? What can I do to support you? That really goes such a long way. And then the next slide we're going to talk about is how to support someone with vasculitis. So this is definitely something for all of the caregivers who are here today who might be listening. Um, these are some really good ways to, um, you know, not support someone, but also to support someone. So let's go through the list here. So the first one we have is let the person know that you're available to listen whenever they want to talk. Admit if you feel awkward. It's okay. You know, it's better to be honest rather than try to pretend that nothing is wrong. Um, the next one is if you, if you struggle knowing what to say to someone who's dealing with these health challenges, remember that just being there it really says a lot. Just, you know, sending them a quick message, just being there, um, being by their side, sitting down next to them, just offering that sense of safety and comfort really goes a long way. 
And when you can't visit in person, just let them know you're thinking of them, you know, a call, a text. I am a big fan of old school sending people cards in the mail. You know, we get so inundated with digital communications nowadays. I really love to get a handwritten card in the mail. So I think that goes a long way too. And then try to keep your relationship as normal as possible, right? Um, you know, share a joke or two, you know, you can laugh with your, your uh, loved one who's dealing with this um, condition. You can uh, kind of lighten the load for them. And then I want to also kind of go over some of the don'ts. Uh, try not to tell the person you know how they feel or compare their situation to someone else's. I've had this happen to me before. I don't know if any of you out there have also ha had this happen to you. Um, it can be really, really, really hurtful. It can be really dismissing. Um, everyone's circumstances are unique, as we know. Um, the next one is don't don't tell them that everything will be fine. These are sort of those platitudes that just makes it harder for people like us with this condition to be able to talk about the challenges of their situation. It sort of uh, it just sort of closes the the conversation, right? And then the next one here is try not to say, you know, oh, stay positive or look on the bright side, right? Rather than um, you know, pressuring them to behave in a certain way, just make it clear like, hey, you are, feel, you are free to express however you feel today, even if you just want to vent, you want to be heard, um, you know, yeah, you can offer that support to them without trying to change the, the way that they feel. And if they feel sad, it's okay. If they feel angry, it's okay. If they're frustrated, it's okay you know, feelings are, emotions and feelings are neither good or bad, right? They just are. It's almost look at feelings as neutral. Um, feeling angry is not a bad thing. You know, we as humans, we have anger in ourselves. That's, we are, you know, those feelings wouldn't exist if they weren't meant to be, right? It's all about processing them in healthy ways and having that really solid support system there that you can lean on. So, um, I see some people in the chat as well. Uh, Lori says, don't start a sentence with at least. Yes, uh, yes, we definitely don't want to start sentences with at least because that just immediately dismisses, um, you know, anything that the person really has said. And I actually had a doctor say that to me once who, you know, said, well, at least you don't have cancer. And I was really, really kind of hurt by that because um, it, you know, I was very upset for what I was going through. I was scared. I was, you know, terrified of what life was going to be like with this um, vasculitis. And, um, you know, that was a really kind of hurtful thing to say to me because if I felt very um, undermined, I felt very dismissed that my feelings weren't validated. So, yeah, let's we have to be mindful um, of that as well. And uh, it looks like Ida there shared a link, the calm blog about the feelings wheel. Yes, a feel, the feelings wheel, this is something that you can all Google. Um, it is the feelings wheel, or sometimes it's called the emotional wheel. Um, it's a really great tool to help you identify exactly what you're feeling, especially on those tough days when it's kind of hard to find the words. So um, I really love that you shared that, Ida. Thank you so much. And it looks like she dropped the link in there as well. So the next thing I want to share is about community and support. So this is really one of the most uplifting aspects of navigating vasculitis. I think we can all agree is really finding our community, finding our support. They can become such great tools in our toolbox and really the secret weapons for all of these challenges we're dealing with. Um, the first things first is share your story, share your story. Um, it's really like opening up a window to let in some fresh air, right? It's when you share your journey, you're not only releasing your own emotions, but you're also giving other people permission to share. And it's really this um, two-way street of understanding and empathy, right? And I believe, um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe, and Jennifer can correct me if uh, I'm wrong, but I believe there was a workshop on how to share your story with vasculitis. And so I'm sure Jennifer, uh, once the uh, 
once we come to an end here shortly, she can share with us um, where that workshop is. I, I believe there might be a recording of that, but that is a really great tool to use in how to share your own story. It's releasing those emotions. Um, you know, our stories matter, right? I think that we need to do more sharing of our stories because it offers people education. It helps to inspire others. It leads to even comforting ourselves, but also comforting others. It puts people at ease when they hear our stories. Um, it lets people know it's okay to feel this way. So whether you write in a blog or you join, you know, a support group like they offer at the Vasculitis Foundation here for all of us, or simply just talking to a friend, please don't underestimate the power of your own voice. It's really, really powerful. The next one is just simply find your tribe, find your community, find your people. These are people that just get it. They understand what you're going through. They've been there before. Again, organizations like the Vasculitis Foundation are really amazing places to start. Lots of uh, resources, support groups, and just networks of people who know exactly what it's like living with vasculitis. And, you know, support groups, I would say to lean on them, whether it's online or, you know, an online community or a support group locally. Um, some people find support groups on social media like Facebook. I would say to a little word of caution with some of the Facebook groups, sometimes they can be a little doom and gloom. Sometimes they can be a little bit negative. So it's really about, you know, is asking yourself, is this a safe place for me to be? Is this a, the type of mindset that I want to be around? Is this the, does, do I feel uplifted when I enter into this online space, right? So ask those questions, find the comforting space, um, engage with supportive communities that can offer you that practical advice. Uh, even if it's just, you know, you need a good laugh here and there. Um, it's really just a great way to also make friends um, who can really turn into those, you know, lifelong allies as well. So as we come to the end, I want to just say, you know, thank you all for being here. Thank you for sharing in, in the chat and being part of this community, being part of, you know, uh, this learning and being open to this journey of vasculitis. It's not always easy to talk about grief and the challenges that come with vasculitis, but I hope that I offered some practical tools for you to use today. And again, uh, just want to reiterate that the fact that you're here today really shows your strength and resilience and just um, having that curiosity of being that lifelong learner and adding more of the tools to your toolbox as you navigate this journey is really powerful. So thank you so much for allowing me to share today. That, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. So I know we have one question in the Q&A box. It's more um, about your slides. They want to know if you'll, if you, if the slides can be made available them so yes okay yes absolutely yes <laughs> definitely um they're kind of they're kind of pretty right <laughs> i thought when i created the slides i thought okay what's a really good color that's not you know grief is such a hard topic i thought well let's make them pink and yellow and bright colors definitely and yes yeah, someone asked if there's going to be a recording yes this will be record this it has been recorded will be would be kind of bad right it's too, it's too late for that this has been recorded and we will send the links out to everyone who registered but if you have other questions for noel um feel free to it's a, it's a fairly small group so if you want to just even unmute and ask a question that is fine with us as well this is more interactive maybe than other webinars or you can definitely pop it in the q a box yeah I see Deborah shared a really powerful comment. She said that she used to try and get her family to feel sorry for her, but she realized they would get overwhelmed and burned out. And so then she switched over to total independence, keeping it all of all to herself as to not burden and frighten them. And she said it's tough because she carries it inside more, more than often. Um, so reading the Facebook groups really helps through a lot of those feelings as well. So yeah, just finding that good community of people who understand. And, you know, hopefully Deborah, I was able to share some tools and just some phrases to use with your loved ones to kind of help them, you know, understand what you're going through. I had a question. Um... It made total sense 
you know, that you don't want to be telling people like you shouldn't feel this way or you need to be positive. But even like what you were talking about, you know, I've run into that before, like with some of the Facebook groups where it just feels like you almost hurt for them because it is so negative. And so Mm -hmm. those who are care partners or even those who are interacting with other people with vasculitis, when you, when you see a friend that just can't seem to get out of the negative cycle, like what can you do to help that doesn't sound dismissive, if that makes sense? Yeah, I think it's, you know, number one, it's, it goes back to, you know, do you want to be heard or do you want to be helped? Right. And figuring out what is it that that person needs at that moment. And oftentimes I feel that those, those types of people, they, they need to be heard. You know, they haven't shared their story in a safe place. Um, They haven't been validated enough. They haven't been seen enough. They haven't been heard enough. And I think it's really important to just allow that person to go through those feelings and offer that comfort and say, you know, hey, I, I totally, you know, I'm here for you. You're safe with me. Um, if you want to continue sharing, I am so here for you. I am listening. You know, I um, I validate you and your, your feelings are validated. And the more that a person has that safety and can process those emotions, the more they start to kind of subside. And then that person can start to feel more empowered to, you know, continue their journey in a more positive way. Yeah, go ahead, Lori. Um, yeah, I just wondered if you had any suggestions for, um, I, I participate in an online support group for EGPA, um, but no one is, you know, really local in my area all the time. And so I didn't know if you had suggestions for finding like an in-person support group for for rare diseases or vasculitis or or anything like related to these conditions, because I can't find like a local in-person support group. And I feel like I could really benefit from that. I did start counseling, which has been helpful. Yes, for sure. As far as the local groups, I know that uh, Meetup is a place you could probably search to see if there's anything there in the Meetup. Um, And, you know, Lori, if you're not finding an in-person one, I would say start one yourself, you know, take, take the, the, take the lead and and start when I guarantee like people, you know, they would really appreciate that. And if, you know, if you find ways to get that word out that there is a group there that exists, um, I know meetup is a great place to do that. I don't know if Jennifer has any other recommendations either for finding more kind of a local based one. I know, um, here in Arizona, we uh, Trina uh, heads up our local support group here, and she has um, in-person meetings, and I believe she's still on the call today, too, so maybe she has some recommendations as well. Yeah, um, I put Jody Hall. She's on the call today as well. Um, I put her email. If, if, if there is a local group, and there are not as many, unfortunately, though, they are starting to rebuild, as Noelle said. During COVID, a lot of, you know, because for health reasons, even, you know, because people with vasculitis are immunocompromised, a lot of the in-person groups stopped meeting, but they are trying to rebuild. And so Jody Hall here at the Vasculitis Foundation works with our online and our in-person support groups. And so if there is one that is as restarted, she would probably know about it and she would be a great person. Absolutely. And um, Jennifer put my email in the chat. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I... Uh, Trina Anderson and um, Irene Tipton run the Arizona um, Vasculitis Foundation Support Group, and they do a fantastic job. Um, But if you are in an area where you feel like people could really benefit from this, please email me, and I'd be happy to try and get a group started in your area. That would be fabulous. But unfortunately, right now, the only in-person group that we have affiliated with is in Arizona. Okay. And then I'm not sure what group you said you have like an online group. So the Vasculitis Foundation support groups are Zoom. So at least you're seeing people. You're still not in person, but at least you're seeing faces. It's not just chatting, you know, on like a. And so I'm I'm not sure if you've joined any of those, but I can put that link in the or Jody, do you mind throwing that link in the chat? So if you go to our website under um, there's a, a find support section and we have. We, we have four weekly support groups, one monthly support group, and then a, a couple other, just for people with vasculitis, then we have a couple others that are more specialized, like a teen support group for teens with vasculitis, things like that. So, 
And then maybe the uh, regional conferences would be a good place for people to connect as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not well, I just work for the VF. What? Yeah. Yeah. So we have I mean, regional conferences. Um, we can throw that link. And I will also try to include these links in the email that goes out. Um, I've been making notes. I wanted to include some of the some of the stuff on slides too. But See, this, um, this is the power of community, everybody helping out and offering solutions, which is, you know, so beautiful. Yeah. So if you go to our website, we have, um, we did, we did one in South Carolina a few months ago, and then we have one coming up in Austin, Texas, Scottsdale, Arizona, Cleveland, Ohio, um, Washington, DC. And then we're trying to plan one in Seattle. That's still to be determined, but, and we try to do those on a fairly regular basis, hitting different parts of the country so that hopefully you can find one close to you. These are one day conferences. They're a great way to connect and also meet some great medical you know, get some great information, you know, information from medical experts. Mm -hmm. We would love for you to attend those conferences. Um, I'll be going to the Arizona one. So hopefully I get to see some faces there. I know I'll probably see Trina there. <laughs> Robin put a question about, yeah, not a question, but she talked about North Carolina. So definitely, I know there used to be a fairly active group there. So that would be an area where if, you know, connect with Jody, she could probably help you get a group started again, because we might have people that were part of the former group that would be interested in, you know, if someone was willing to kind of start an in-person group again in the North mm -hmm. Carolina area. We had quite a few, again, pre-COVID, there were quite a few very active in-person chapters and we would love to rebuild those. It is wonderful to find that community. Um, so any other questions before, I don't want to cut anybody off, but I don't want to <laughs> make you hang on forever. I do want to thank Noel so much. That was wonderful. I want you to join us for other webinars. We have at least four webinars each month on edu you know, some are more educational, others are more living well. And Amgen, AstraZeneca, and Novartis uh, help sponsor those so that we can offer those to you guys free of charge. And we're really grateful for them. So 